still have a number of sort of events that are going to take sort of six months out of the year. So there's the next time, and you can do 60 seconds to turn that into a series. It is. Thanks very much for coming and welcome to the Mind of McDonald's Live at Home in Townsend. It's a resource for the people who are going to be until recently worked with Radio National, but I think it's a great group to do historical research yourself. I'm a little bit growing in this week for the radio documentary series. But that's why we don't have more in the other series. So it's so interesting in how Australia and Queensland came to have the railway system in the past. So tonight we're talking about the significance of the 150 years of railway construction and the role of the railway as a play in our economic and social development of the state. Because the first railway in Queensland was opened on the 31st of July. Since then, many of our towns owe their existence to the railways, many of our towns owe their extension to the railway. The choice of where the rail line is put will take the end of its life. But then, a lot of the decisions are made by the tickets of this railway being mainly run by internal governments. For some reason, private enterprise and governments don't want to see it. Down the track, it's a word that can't be measured, so the importance of rail was and is, I think, very difficult to explain sometimes. And to understand rail, rail is pretty much successful, but it could be. But it's always hard to get to know something that um, not a lot of people have assessed. Um, it's basically pretty much the way rail is run. It's actually very nice. Anyway, joining me are two people. Who know an awful lot about the history of rail in Queensland. There's Geraldine Maples, CQ Raven, the Workshops Rail Museum, the Research Rail at Best Museum of Sydney, and she has a lot of interests, including the industrial heritage of the Railway Workshops site and the role of rail in war, which is something we'll talk about tonight because railways do have a big role to play in the first and second world wars. And Greg Hallam is a third generation railway worker whose family's connection with QR goes back even 10 years, and he's QR as a story. A fantastic story. He's recently completed the research master's at UQ at the Lab of Victor Hallam, who was Commissioner of Railways for some time ago, and we'll speak about Colonel Charles Evans as well. But later, Greg, first of all, a bit of historical background. Can you tell us about the first time of railway? This was it's 150 years since the beginning of the railway suspension, of course. Um, to go to breakfast today speaks for itself. This is not really a big story. I'm not sure if it's just a big story, so I'm not sure that it's going to hold up in the stream. But there's a couple of uh, significant things about it. It was uh, really the first section of um, frequency stage five hundred kilometres of running line. Um, it wasn't the first of that stage in the world, but it was by any means that happened on the basis of Norway. This one was in secondary one Australia and New Zealand. And it was a couple of that had as a significance, and I think one probably the crying context is that uh, it's the first government road line uh, built in the colonies as well. Uh, the southern colonies had done that, they had railways on the border, but they were all kind of 
has no like judgment. And here in Queensland, there's judgment from the word go, which is a prefixes go. And um, I think the other thing that was significant at the end of the Australian conference was uh, the fact that it didn't go um, logically. <laughs> you know, it's things that are reversed and all. But they had actually, uh, you know, first realized that you can't go from your capital city, John, uh, anywhere else. It actually went from a place as far away from Brisbane as you could possibly get when you think about Ipswich, it's going to work best. So why did you do that? Why did you do that? Oh, well, they think, it's a little shorthand way I always tell people is that you think you're going to get it cheap, and that's what we do. But uh, to, ca- to make it very so simple and succinct, was the 1860s, there was an enormous demand for wood in the world at that stage. Um, the American Civil War was on, and these were going, you know, how profitable was wood. Um, the Scottish, of course, um, had uh, controlled the upper house of um, the Prince of Parma there. And uh, when you think about the, the amount of time it took to get from the Maranao to the Orient Bay and those places to get the wool basically down to the ship so you got it halfway around the world to be getting there to the north of England, and then that's even turning to get it across the north of England to the lakes of Otago and the considerable uh, mix of African Americans that was out there. So it came back to wool, it came back to sheep, and basically it was a politics of situation was that um, the viable point was primarily one for the world of England, basically. So I'm not sure that's a new thing. But what why choose narrow boundaries? What is the point? Oh, this is where we come to the Irish one. Um, <laughs> those of you, those who are very familiar with the Queensland Railways, I'll give you a few story and talking to railway colleagues out there. Um, those of you who remember Vince O'Rourke, our, um, our, um, our last commissioner for the Queensland Railways and our first chief executive officer um, from about uh, 20 years ago now. Um, Vince O'Rourke and Adrian Fitzgibbon, I'm sure they kept reckoning they're cut from the same cloth because they're both from uh, Crystal Lane in Spain or something like that. Uh, Fitzgibbon was the man who actually was probably our first consultant in Queensland and um, one time when Vince got the grants for it and I told the story about that the first brigade when he had a consultant and I said, well, you know, basically a consultant comes to you and says, we can give you this much for that much and immediately fall in love with this sort of thing and uh, the, the simple basis was Fitzgibbon had experience with um, uh, using the medium gauge railway to run places around the world the prefix six gauge was still not 100% sure, I think, why it would come as it does. But there is evidence that at that stage, when they were building locomotives in uh, Britain, it was basically about prefix six, was appeared to be one, one reason was that it's as narrow as you can get, basically, to get underneath and actually service a locomotive to get it going and things like that. The other thing with it, too, was that uh, it's given his uh, report to Parliament, and then he claimed that the bloke who gave to Parliament. I'm sure Irish and Vince O'Rourke had gone up this bloke and when they said about the, the cost and why the price of gas. He said, if you go for anything you like, why that's probably going to be the extra one point. The other point basically would be that you're going to pay for it as well. And the other thing is, and it's pure Irish this one, and it's an absolute marvel, he said, it's better to go 500 miles at 50 miles an hour than 250 miles at 25 miles an hour. And that was it. Yeah, yeah please, it's a C, Irish. And basically he said, yep. And, uh, and for the Queensland Parliament, he his costings and he presented to basically, you know, if you go for the broader gauge, you'll get this much railway, but if you go for the different gauge, which is the narrow gauge, you'll get this sort of thing. So that was the, so it's all coming back to business, but I mean, the cost is surely going to be that much for the Well, you know, that's the interesting thing, is that the great historian of Queensland Railway, John Knowles, he's, uh, I think he's doing a lot of work at the moment, you know, for 50, 60 years, and he said at the end of the day, he thinks it's giving was wrong, but, you know, there's about 12, 13,000 miles of railway from Australia to Queensland. The other thing, you know, I don't think people realise, you know, for years and years it was always considered to be about railway and things like that, the prefix system. I'll always walk beside you and you are really the front and back end and everything like that. But if you go through the 1860s, I mean, the decision to build the prefix system to get up the Geelong Road, well, well, you know, they had the steam train just up there um, a couple of weeks back for 150 of them, you know, again, you're retracing the steps of 150 years ago and you've got the steam train right there for that. But, um, I think the interesting thing was that first gauge of prefix six. Let's talk about the main island. People don't realise what was explored around the world these days in South Africa today. I think I've seen pictures of about 15 percent of the cars that they use in the world today is actually that prefix six. So it was the MGM, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, six years and some years. And but back, back in the telegraph, exactly. Yeah. Right. So they were, they were locked in, though, weren't they? Once they built that first line, they were locked in from that day. Well, the funny thing was, they were thinking, even back then, they said, by the 1890s, you know, they'd clean the lanes, they might have to put two lines up there. And they said, we may eventually go to broader gauge. But they said, well, then the greatest coal firms, you know, in Australia and some of the biggest in the world, cheaper things, you know, 50,000 ton of coal, they can run it every, uh, like, maybe 90 years. 
Kommentare mit uns mehr, wenn ihr mit uns sprechen wollt. Ja, ja. So, we have stuff to talk about. Well, this is a good <laughs> yes, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think I expect that from Tyrion. You know, you know, people, I'll, I'll explain a little bit. I was quite smart over the years, basically. You know, 150 years ago, we were set in the colonies. Um, it's nice to have the crown or anything like that kind of glory. I mean, the colonies were only concerned about keeping in their borders. Yeah, so it's all got to happen 50 years in the past, so the land's still over time being new. Still, it caused a lot of problems. It's still does, isn't it? So, of course, Given the old world, there's still thoughts, don't they? In some ways, we, we still don't have a national system that's really good enough because of that original problem we talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, the, the idea is about 100, 110 years ago, there's a very strong case for what had to be what we consider to be the national government mm-hmm. because there's more of it than you know, people like the public like reporting that. But about 27, 28, 100 years ago, a number of really good supporters of the national of the national concept that took to the very good idea. That was made up of recent things like that. Yeah, well, we had the other day this idea, of course. Oh, that's a topic. Yeah, it's a topic of uh, controversy. So, so we had a railway industry start up back then, and so um, telegram never seemed to be able to get switched. The workshops and up there, were they, they were part of that original plan of industry? Yeah, yeah. Just to bring it a bit closer to me. Yeah, absolutely. The um, first railway workshop in Queensland was in the Central Bank of the Bermuda River, which is very close to the Central Bank of the Bermuda River. And it started off very small. They um, picked up this building from um, two over two million pound um, steel and put those in the UK. I love it to the American dollars, but not the UK. And uh, they gradually built up this kind of uh, railway workshop there. And they put their uh, father in law to their bank and said, Look, they're going to pay for that. Um, and through then the um, Tyrion made this. Years they were expanding the supply of this material and gradually expanded more to the point that they um, still decided to pay for it. Yeah, so the district was a centre of industry. Yeah, that's right. The centre they say it's the first place that they had yeah. a problem with that. So the technology, technology back then, there were other countries that had a railway motor that's already running on tracks, so they would have felt they could buy them off the shelf at some point or another because they were importing. Were they importing that technology from the local the whole they, they local They imported a whole lot of motor technology from the big seven countries, which they were importing seven different ones. They built the first two locomotive wheels from them, and that's the exhibit that you know most of those that they had to buy. Yeah, but did they have to change because the day was going to be changed? Uh, all to those original locomotives? Yeah, they did. They built the They would have had to. 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 So the workers came from from where? Germany? And of course, the locals then never got the skills necessary and come to the city in the 70s. They were already working around the motors. And through some railroad industry, it's a lot of innovation that's going on. So they put these great drawing offices in engineering and locomotive engineers to put those in that practice on the railroad locomotives. And um, the council must have been uh, pretty important skills for them when they were going to get going. Yeah, um, well, I think that the um, practice of um, that would have continued and continued. So, in the Second World War, they were actually doing things like uh, plantation and power production on the front of the German uh, farm crops. So, they had stuff called steam mills and locomotive engineers and so on. So, they, for a long time, were using that kind of inventive kind of behaviour to be able to do the highest standard kind of work. Well, that's incredible skills and innovation when you think about it. It's like, I mean, it, this is the coming of the yeah. world, right? Well, I, I, I just I, I feel like the, it, it, I'm a little embarrassed because I, I sit there, but the railway workshops were like a, a centre for innovation. And, you know, in 1900 and 1902, they constructed a railway structure, which was this fabulous building that stretched to, to power in the tracks of people coming in. And they were making a statement about how innovative they were. Look at what they're doing here. 
in the face of this kind of authority and kind of this moral stuff. So I made a couple of energy. Anyhow, these low mark bell icons and everywhere else in the city and style were just coming out. And there was just a bit of money from the money other parts of the money from the other parts of the Commonwealth as well. And, and the fancy of that stuff was I came with this thing. I was 64, I'm in 65. I think a couple of nights in the middle of the city was probably just going to get 35, 40 girls and be done with the rest of it. So I could just get out of it. And then I heard from my fellow in Quebec at that hotel in early 63, the guy saying, I'm selling this, I'm going to sell it to you. And it was three years before, three years before, but actually the interest rate was dead at 3 to 30. And the third and third time was when I learned about your appearance. So, you know, I expected if I was to sell this guy with a wallet out, I just, you know, overpriced a little bit more than what I would have in the first few years of it. And, you know, I said, well, I should risk it, but I wouldn't have wanted that much. And then for the third or fourth time, you know, from this kid from Canada, young of ours, and I've been listening to that whole thing. And it was just, you know, it's just a normal one. Yeah, 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 it's just a normal one.
the actual term of it, being obliged to train someone so young to be a field worker, which means that a 56-year-old someone has training for this is good, and I think that this is a good question. When I can start with the first one, and then we'll say anything about it, because we can start with one of the first trials, not of ours. Um, that first came when I was at the time in Toronto in Germany, and I saw some young Israelis who were my first friends, and they were doing sort of work in the film industry. Um, and then the other part of the century that I actually was doing when I was going back in Britain, and I was with uh, Ian and Andrew Lawrence and the three of them, and they were from the Flat Railways, and I was surprised by the boss from the Air and Flat Railways. I feel sorry for the poor beggars because they got on a ship, you know, and they came back, and then once I paid some money, I got them on, I think it was a small piece, and they came on to Miles Street Station. But then I was just looking for some kind of a place I couldn't buy, and this kind of nurse said, well, you know, you have to go through the railway there. And then that was some kind of like, you know, and I'm thinking, what's the matter? You know, they're all doing weird, like, and so I had, you know, this kind of like post-war period, where it's just like these people are working for these guys, and I'm told, you know, what's going on the railway there, so they're arresting me.
Horses, hay for horses to carry in the desert, and they walked by, by rail. And there was a um, already established rail network in Papua and other places, um, particularly in Blue Gate. And then they had built a whole heap for like two days of illegal horse carriage to take from a lot of the um, land of Papua and other places in the Gold Rush to take away from the Gold Rush because it was just too hard to obtain. And, and similarly, there was um, a series of hunting trains that passed along the Papua and other Yeah, but they kept moving and kept getting more and more developed over the years. And with these industrial war going on, there were enormous masses of land that had been taken from the people. So they kept on getting recruits and ammunition to the front of the war. Well, there's a statistic um, that in one part of Bahrain, I think it's the Arab Spring, over a million um, sheep had been massacred with the land in the Arab Spring. And when you think about what that equates to, Queensland the roads are quite expensive. Uh, means of efficient transport. And you say early Queensland was quite expensive. So I wonder about the, 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 the horses and the trains. Yeah, just the horses. The horses, horses were, were brought by rail from across, across Queensland. In fact, it became practice when the free rail came out to have all these sort of memos about um, coming to the um, horses that they required because of the bad roads. They had to have this whole logistical organisation and there might be a lot of that land that was taken. You had to get all the horses off the farm, you had to get rid of all the horses, then they had to get them all back in the farm and there were different numbers of horses. Yes, people are wondering why they didn't get them on the road because it's very difficult getting horses on board. You have to get all sorts of vehicles on board, that's why there's a lot of boats and they didn't go there and they might have been thinking they couldn't get over. And I was reading a thing that even at the Bahrain stage, some of the stuff was doing itself so down to this and then trying to walk their horses and women and putting them there and then they went off to the road there and there. But it was, it was actually quite cool that they went because um, the, uh, the local police were, and the railways were actually uh, both by the, by the army and troopers and that place and they were treating the horses. And so they basically said, well, we're not going to stand here, get up in the wagons and things like that and treat the horses. And the railways went, well, you can't do that, not while you're moving. So anyway, I said, well, you know, what are you going to do? So the railways came up with something to do. And they said, well, basically, they tried to feed back to the horses. And, you know, put, put that on them to stop them up and put them back to the ground. And other part of that road then, I was, um, uh, but again, of course, uh, the, you know, the technical railway can exercise the horses at bottom down. And, you know, they exercise them and they don't want to take trains on board. Well, the railways aren't ready to put up with this. So, so the, the, the works up to New Zealand obviously are still going on at the moment. But do they produce any things apart from railway equipment for the war effort? Yes, they did. They um, they uh, pulled up to the munitions manufacturer. So they went straight to a rubbish consortium. But um, there was a period where the Australian government was the uh, railway works up was actually trying to put out the need for munitions. It turned out to be logistically difficult because of the industry and the market for the munitions that had to be. But they did that, and that's actually one of the few places that you see women employed um, in the um, uh, industries that are involved in women in the labour. So uh, in uh, Cooktown, um, Victoria, there was a munitions workshop where there were women employed trying to do munitions work. And certainly in the UK, women work in the railway. I think it was about 30% of the railway workforce were because there were good women and they did things like um, making carriages, walking up the cable and so on. But the people in Queensland were seriously afraid of having women work because, you know, the easy seats just had no space in the seats and they wouldn't be able to talk to the men. But there was a woman that was employed in Rockhampton to do um, sort of like the um, um, basically training for the munitions workers. So they, they geared up in Queensland, they geared up in Rockhampton to do this work. And then um, the guys would go down to the factory and they'd go and do it. But they also built small railway trains for the people in the area. Of course, the amazing part about that is that the people sort of just keep on going to the railway and they're not going to do this. And um, everyone's thinking back to the day of war, and it's 
the worst part to me is sitting there feeling like this is a one-way ratchet. You know, like, are we still going to run this thing? Is this about Jason Momoa? You want to say that with Jason Momoa, but it, it really surprised the entire world about the first one. I think it's one thing actually doing it that way and then twisting it up the other and saying, um, Pharrell, I did it. Why not just go see some person you can't see? This time it's more because it's a film that apparently is going to be on the Star Wars and Wall of Dara, but it's amazing that we can get famous for it. We're in the city of high country down there and all three shot up there. And so we can experience the fun while we're there. So I think we could down to that, but as well as like we can kind of see the Star Wars and the fans that are there for it. And I thought that was really neat because all these really cool stuff that we can I guess Monster Hunter City is a pretty cool city and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of kind of cool rules that you can find and things that you'll see there that you can't really get back from the film school or the film festival and stuff. But the other one, Cruella, was the same second day where it seems to be good for the anime industry so they really got it from this guy who thinks it's Star Wars that the film was really the same stuff. It's interesting that some of the things that Cruella's known for is probably still in the MC. So that was about 2,500 words or so. And this one between Sid and Sidney, um, Harry Garcia, which is one of my favorite directors, and then he is very well known for the kind of DC to Sidney, but he didn't work on these, I think it's an anime film as well, and it's one of those things that you can find a fan and kind of have a cool collection of DC to Sidney as well. He was with Ramon, and uh, he was on the cover of the anime video Prince of Bel Air, so that was really cool to see. I think that that's one of the things, if you, if you did follow the set of the and you made it to Bel Air, it's at that time, it's quite high and wide for the set. So that, yeah, he was out there in lots of DC. There was a guy called John Palmer who was one of two great Korea um, uh, railway workers who then they cut to the aliens going, oh, look, they go to the other city. Come on. And they jumped in and they managed to save the land and they never had a horse racing. And then there's the stories that guys on the um, Korea and the Oh, sorry, they stole the plane. They took the plane, yes. Yeah. So they've been this infantry attack with the, all the all the drivers have jumped out and then they drive the plane off the roof and so now they're in the same same big family outside the building where all these guys are. But um but there's also stories like on the um the Mary Alice where they cut the railway workers to the big bad guy who then they get cut off and they have to go to the city. And then there's stories of people who then who um worked um worked on the like in the light rail um companies who um were wounded, came back with cancer, and they tell the story of the people that they did to to get them where they were going and how they failed. Because you know, it was a community here, it was like, like it, it was a kind of like community for its own side, which is why the people have come to it. Yeah, yeah, and it was definitely a, 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 a company culture and kind of community that they, they worked up. But there was also um, uh, fundraising that went on during the war, and they had to fill their paperwork and they apparently paid for the um, the police for military justice and they paid, they also supported um, the different stores and so they um, they would sell the railway workers and they also contributed to that kind of fundraising as a result of the war and there's a fantastic picture for the um, opening of the the Mary Alice Ball where one of the workers there who was killed and his family and his wife and his son and his children they paid to that fund and they designed the plane to take them there. So there was there was definitely um, a different kind of um, that's why it's it's interesting that the big thing that um, seems to kind of steal the world from the kind of anime that you know you got you know the police or the prison was uh, was the the main thing but that well I mean that prince of Africa that was what started the abuse for all these women right and it probably started the same story that you can't find in these films here that you know. I think when the hunting kids there, they make all the workers the same. You never see the bad guys work with other men, right? Like, you kind of find them, you know, they've got the back of the back of the hunting kind of thing. But um, I think the whole guy had to steal the ferry boat because he was just out there for fun with the guys on the yacht. And he got up there and uh, he sat back to the horse guys, the guys that he was working with, and the prison was sort of abusing his hand. And then that was the big part of the thing. So it's like, same kind of thing that Oregon does on the set of the film. One other thing, too, that I think that uh, Morel adds to your cast and the kind of like the effect that it adds is it, it's this really good story. Actually, I um, uh, took a read on uh, the American article that guy that not everyone in the IRS is the one that sees this and how they arrive at some convoys and all this stuff. And this one guy says that the kind of really like this story is quite a part of the Morel's kind of funding. He was still involved by the time in the 1940s, you know, and he said. 
this is what I owe it, you know, everybody we sit down down the hall and say, this guy's the one that owes the bike, the other guy's the other side, and the bike calls me and gives me a cell phone. So I went to the hospital in Britain, and everybody had these big stories, and they all ended up saying, this guy wants to do it, and they tried to get up and this guy called, and he said, well, this is what I have to pay for it. And so it was quite a group of them. So I never even, you know, even though I owe them, I never went to them, but then this is a bit of a more in-depth story, but it's as well as the directing the bike to and from and the full service, proper call, and um, they do struggle. Why didn't get back to Melbourne from our Melbourne from the Sydney trip? You know, they get such a bad you know, well, I used to you know, such a twenty percent bad times, but it's always kept clear. The bike probably can't find it because I don't make no. Well, yeah, of course, so you mentioned that a lot of the, the people at the book club and stuff are West Coast based. In fact, you the Pacific. So they work around the country. So, so, so what was the book what was the book doing in the second world war? Because there was a lot of it wasn't just I mean eight bits of eight metric words to keep the trains running, but it was also a great way to get people to the war. Yeah, well the at Ipswich they uh, raised a free and bait shop and it was I think the second book was kind of um, workshopping in the country and oh, they they yeah, absolutely. They they pulled it off in the front line in those days. I think it was just about six months or something that they had it. And they built it, they supplied uh, food for the munitions that they had um, at that plane. And they also did things like um, putting marine engines and made the, the best series of muskets and that sort of thing to go for the combat. It was a bit of a hard time for the time for the military. And they did the whole thing in the way that they took out the red flag. They went out, made the castle, and put the muskets right in the front of the wall, all by themselves. They just forgot to have old school gloves and that you know, to put out the flag. But there's, but there's, you know, any number of those sort of things. You've got other technologies and ways that you can do that, apart from using steam or other technologies. But the other thing, too, is that the difference in the Second World War was we were fighting from the start. You know, back to Adam, you know, when you know, the Adam and Scott, we basically said that, that you know, we had the Adam Scott's fight. And he tried to get all the records, and he won the right up to work in the Second World War, and he brought the, the casualty flag down the front of the train cars. And there was, there was, um, you know, there were literally no pockets up in those those places for that whole thing to be put out there. And then the men who came through, I mean, they had their dickies and that, but that wasn't the main focus of the war. So the, the war broke down from, from, from 42 when the fighting started up to, you know, muskets and rallies, and that's the war for people. Of course, it's been fighting from the start. For many five years, it looked like a war because nobody else seemed to be able to stand the idea of leaving. In the Eastern Front, it's a bit different scenario. So, by the time they got into World War II, they just basically got on board. And they sort of just dressed up the food and they just went out there. And after those two or three months, that was, we were lucky with that, I think, in the action side of things. But it was just a sheer physical exhaustion for a second world war. So, it was a terrific return, actually, to kind of pick up on the book that that was their fight. They just kind of had a halfway through the years, kind of had to run. Piece of ground he was an 89 year old um, train fireman basically uh, who went out on the western line and said, I'm just basically trying to do the thousand miles of the battle, you know, because he said that there were, you know, because of the exigencies of the times, a thousand miles of train, failure, failure, back, failure, back, failure, back. He said, the thousand miles of the battle, you know, and I said, how did you get through it? And he said, I was drunk and stupid. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but all the other stupid people who made it out to war just kind of yeah, all those people kind of stayed for that sort of war, but he said, well, I'm just going to get this and this. And it's all about the patient and about the story. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that the time that I was there, the other thing that was really that I had learned after the war was the value of the Aussie dollar and how much it had had they been in World War II. And what I found out great was the incredible statistics on the on the Ipswich story. By 1918, 25 percent of local Aussies had lost their mother. They didn't have fiddles, they didn't have different war paint to sell off in the war. And then that country that was built in Morales had basically been defeated. You know, and they tried to run around Ipswich, they got the money for the next few years, and ended up not being able to get out until they sent the family money. You know, and they could deteriorate until it's time of war, but they could do that even as the Olympics are going on. Yeah, that's right. There's so much to talk about. But I'll give you a chance to kind of tell us the things. So it is pretty much the first world. How was it in the that's the military thing again there, you know, and basically, uh, so this is the conventional railways before and during and during the day, but you know, the um, area, okay, as I said the other day there, and um, he actually has a home in that area, and it was the old basic grade war, and all these trains and all the new trains and all the buddies there. Duncan, what was he saying? Well, I was 
must have done it. Because we must have, it must have, it must have been. Or else we have to do it. Well, actually, now that I've lost it, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't done. It was quite good, you know. So it was kind of a shocking thing. But the thing is, like, again, we wouldn't separate from the world. I mean, in the bank in the last half of the century ago, I mean, we were looking at the market today, and this is concrete, you know, this concrete weapons, and we're really leaders in this country. What we have done with weapons is that it's going to go back to the um, Vietnam Bank, you know, the Vietnam War Council, but basically the kind of war that I've ever been able to see here is that it's going to be one or two, and it's going to be a great support. And we're going to be a fine period to the young people.
and the peace of God are really needed in this country. But there's more that can be said than what I've said, isn't there? There must be there's something coming. Hopefully, a, a good way of life is going to be coming. But there are people who choose to not have anybody to get involved with the Indian Nepal conflict and things that they're calling working it out. You get to see that kind of work because that idea is only about 30 years old. So, it's a little bit of a But, uh, Some social media guys who look like the Pagans of course in Australia are trying to take it to another level. So, <laughs> so look, um, we'll leave it there. But if you have any more questions, if, if Tim's obviously going to have another look at what I've actually spoken about here today, um, if you have any more questions, you can, you can speak to me and I'm sure we will do. But uh, please join me in thanking the three friends from QR and for the time that you know, to throw away your church music. Thank you very much for the work, Margie. Thank you for the audience. Thank you.